So, by way of introduction, I'm Angela Jackman. I'm a partner at Simpson Miller Solicitors, and my practice covers mental capacity law, human rights, judicial review, and um, my cases I've been most passionate about over the last four years is the A and B case, looking at um, the rights and difficulties that women in Northern Ireland face in terms of accessing abortions on the NH NHS, and I've had the privilege to work with one of our panellists here, um, Keelan. So in terms of where we are with reproductive rights, we are quite rightly celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Abortion Act 1967. But at the same time, it's my view that we're at a critical time when globally women's reproductive rights are under attack, and that has been very clearly demonstrated by the talk that we had from Linda just before um, lunch. On a domestic level, I also feel that time is ripe for looking at reform of the Abortion Act, and there is a movement currently taking place in terms of broader decriminalisation of abortion. And time is also really important at looking at ensuring that we can enhance women's rights to reproductive services. And we'll have, uh, I think, an issue flagged up by one of the speakers at the end around some ethical issues that we as women perhaps may struggle with, but I think that we need to be open-minded and really look at issues of choice. And it goes without saying that the vital campaigns in Northern Ireland and the Republic um, do require our support, and that's in terms of the Abortion Act not having been incorporated in Northern Ireland on devolution, and the troubling Eighth Amendment in the Republic of Ireland, uh, where there's been lots of campaigns and demonstrations to try to overturn that. Um, the Eighth Amendment effectively gives the same legal recognition to the fetus as it does to the rights of women. Anyway, today's panel is going to be addressing many of these issues. As time is short, each of my esteemed colleagues will speak for up to 14 minutes. If necessarily, I'll breathe very gently down your necks to, to wind you up. Um, because we do want to throw the floor open at the end for a good 15 minutes or so so that we can hear from you. And if there's time to actually think about an action plan for where we go from here, as there's so much happening in terms of our rights as women across the world, um, in terms of autonomy with our bodies. So without further ado, I will introduce you to our first speaker, who I was very privileged to meet a few moments ago. It's Dillis and um, you'll see from the pack that she has been an avid campaigner around women's reproductive rights and was instrumental in the creation and the ultimate passing of the Abortion Act 1967. She's campaigned for many years and has been a chair of really important organisations such as Family Planning Association and Brooke. So Dillis is going to address us now. When she's wiped her nose. <laughs> Is this working? Can you hear me? No. You can. Okay. Is that better? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm equally privileged to be not only in a room of such distinguished uh, women, but also so many young women. You've no idea how it heartens me to see anybody under the age of 50 taking <laughs> active interest in things nowadays. <laughs> Now, um, I'm, I'm, as you, I was Secretary of the Abortion Law Reform Association at the time of the passing of the Act. And so effectively, I am today the history lesson, and um, Keelan is the current affairs. Um, <laughs> so I'm briefly going to um, talk about the campaign and who were the major players, uh, and illustrate it by setting it in the context of the 19. 50s and 1960s. The four-year campaign to reform the abortion law, uh, which ended in the Abortion Act, was an all-absorbing and intensive period in my life. It not only awakened me a in me a lifelong interest in the workings of Westminster, but set me on the path for my, the rest of my working life involved in some kind of birth control politics, more or less of over the whole time. My motivation is my profound belief 
in the fundamental importance of access to legal, safe, affordable abortion and contraception for women's empowerment, sexual freedom and self-fulfillment. This belief was rooted in my experience as a sexually active single woman in this country and abroad in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Here, here. <laughs> health terms, the 1950s, when I was growing up, were the dark ages. Contraception was not part of NHS provision. It was patchily available for married women through FPA, Family Planning Association, and some local authority clinics. Abortion was illegal, as were male same-sex relationships. Divorce was difficult and expensive. The choices for a single young woman who got pregnant was a shotgun marriage or give up the baby for adoption. Many resorted to backstreet abortion. The wards of the big urban hospital every Friday night were full of women bleeding from backstreet abortions. Some died, um, many suffered lifelong ill health. I don't know how many of you have seen the film Vera Drake, but that, to my mind, captures uh, the essence of what it was like uh, for women needing abortion in that in before we reform before, before the law was reformed. So looking back, sex for women other than heterosexual marriage was closely connected with guilt, fear, and shame. So given all that, uh, in 1963, when I saw an advertisement in the New Statesman for a part-time secretary for the Abortion Law Reform Association working from home for two pounds a week, I applied and I was selected. And when Vera Houghton, the chair, wrote to me, she said, the work tends to me spasmodic. We don't anticipate it will amount to more than the equivalent of one day a week. There may be exceptional times when we are busy with a campaign. <laughs> well, it was one long campaign and for me, one long learning curve. I joined ALRA at a time of change. Stimulated by the thalidomide tra tragedy, abortion was rising up the public agenda, and with it the realisation that abortion was a major cause of maternal mortality and morbidity. ALRA, a small dormant pressure group whose active time had been from 1936 to 1940, under the energetic leadership of three women, Janet Chance, Alice Jenkins, and Stella Brown, was being taken in hand by two young activists, Madeline Sims and Diane Monday. They were impatient for change, and in 1963, they persuaded Vera Houghton to take the chair. Vera brought to, the, uh, to Aura her 10 years' experience of setting up the International Planned Parenthood Federation working with international family planning pioneers like Margaret Sanger and uh, other various strong women. Vera was key to Alra's success. In their book, Abortion Law Reformed, Hindle and Sims sum it up. Her work for the cause was more important than that of any other personality. But she was unknown because she did not like publicity. So Alra's strategy was to reform the law by working, by concentrating on Parliament. And it also mobilised public opinion, strengthened the organisation's capability through individual membership and support, and publicised the need for reform. As a start, it clarified its aims and embarked on ac activities focusing on Parliament. The outcome was that in the 1964 to 66 Parliament, there were three bills, two unsuccessful uh, attempts in 1965 in the House of Commons, and one taken by Lord Silkin in the House of Lords, which went through all its stages twice, right through to third reading. All good preparation for the young liberal, David Steele, now Lord Steele, firmly ensconced in the Lords, when just after the May 1966 election, he drew third place in the ballot for private members' bills 
and agreed to take abortion law reform. Uh, Vera built this team from, well, we were all young then as well. And um, so we all had our different areas of operation. Diane was vice chairman, and she was the public face in many ways. She undertook the public speaking and went all over the country. Um, she spoke about her own abortion. That was revolutionary stuff in those days. Revolutionary stuff now, so you know, we haven't progressed very much on that score. She reckons that in about four years she made 250 speeches to women's organizations. I think they're still around, but they're not exactly... Um, Oh, my God. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to collapse. <laughs> there was... Um, uh, Diane was vice, was vice chairman. She did the speaking. Madeline Sims was press officer. She wrote letters to the press. She quite frequently wrote letters under, under other... Uh, un, uh, uh, under identities. And um, she quite often conducted com a conversation with herself. We had Alistair, who was the uh, parliamentary lobbyist and sat in the House of Commons, uh, nobbling MPs and peers. One memorable occasion, George Brown uh, said, piss off to him. <laughs> bleep, bleep. <coughs> there was uh, Malcolm Potts, who was a bright young medic from Cambridge, whom Alra sent to uh, uh, Scandinavia and Eastern Europe to look at uh, uh, their abortion services. Um, and then we had two very good uh, consultants who were uh, Peter Degree and uh, David Paintin. I think I'd just like to say in the minutes I've got left that the, the two Labour governments um, of that time were major time of social reform. We had abolition of capital punishment, we had reform of divorce, we had reform of uh, abortion and homosexuality. An awful lot which actually laid the foundation for today's social structures. Um, and in my last remaining minute, I would just like to pay tribute, first of all, to the doughty fighters in Northern Ireland and Ireland for what they've been doing and what they continue to do, and also to my colleagues uh, in the Abortion Law Reform Association. There are not many of us left now, and um, I feel that I'd like to mark their memory by recording my appreciation of having known and worked with them. Thank you. We have much to thank you for and um, cannot underestimate how grateful we are for all the work and commitment that you and your colleagues put in for us the following generation. Moving on to our next speaker, Keelan Gallagher. Well, what can I say? I think everybody knows what a phenomenal <laughs> person we have in Keelan Gallagher QC. Um, outstanding public law um, lawyer and has covered such a range of areas of work and so, so many fundamental challenges, to name a few. Um, her involvement in Hillsborough, important cases such as the Benefits Challenge, um, vital work for young people. She's worked very closely with a number of lawyers and campaigning organisations to secure the rights of vulnerable young people under um, 21 sold down the river, but for people like um, Keelan. Uh, in terms of social services duties towards them and much work around the reproductive um, agenda both in terms of litigation and her strident support and commitment to the campaigns in Northern Ireland and the Republic. I give you Keelan Gallagher. Thanks very much Angela. Um, let me just check. Is that, is that on? Is that working? Great. Um, I love the way Jane started by saying it's not so much a legal presentation as a rant. Uh, I do have some law in my slides, but I suspect I might skip over the law a bit and go for a bit more ranting. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to try to combine the two, it is the plan. Uh, there's four things which I want to cover, although I'm quite happy to ditch one if I see that difficult woman sign coming anywhere <laughs> close to me. So the four things which uh, I was intending to cover were... Firstly, just in broad terms, outline context uh, for reproductive rights and abortion in particular 
the UK, the US and globally. But given what Linda's covered, I can take the US point very shortly. Uh, secondly, I want to focus on Northern Ireland, and that's really going to be the bulk of what I talk about. Uh, thirdly, I want to briefly turn to England and Wales and the need for decriminalisation uh, in England and Wales. And there's some little known concerns about the 1967 Act here and what it means for us in this room. And then fourthly, uh, you might have guessed, I'm going to talk about repeal the 8th, but very, very briefly at the end. And I should say, Cara, who asked a question earlier, is here, um, is running the London Irish abortion rights campaign here. So I can see there are a number of Irish women in the audience and some Irish men, uh, and indeed others who want to show solidarity with the campaign. Please do speak to Cara. She's very keen to get more people to sign up. So moving on then on to context. So the first thing is, uh, we've heard that it's the 50th anniversary of the Abortion Act 1967. And this is obviously a critical anniversary, really needs to be celebrated. And I think we should in this year be shouting from the rooftops about the really brilliant work that Dillis and her colleagues did in 1967, uh, which changed the law and the culture so fundamentally uh, for women in England, Wales and Scotland. Uh, but there's also a very stark reminder about how part of the UK is lagging, frankly disgracefully behind, in reproductive rights terms. Uh, Northern Ireland is still governed primarily uh, by the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, yeah. half a century on. So the picture that Dillis painted for us about what the law was like pre-1967 in England, Wales and Scotland remains the case in Northern Ireland. And there are UK women, Northern Ireland resident women, who are second class citizens in the UK, who remain trapped in the permafrost of 1966 that Dillis was talking about. Uh, and we had a survey, I think Angela may go to it uh, later, there was a survey where people were asked um, from a list of countries which they thought was the most restrictive in terms of abortion rights. And not a single person who filled in the survey said the UK. And I think when we turn to Northern Ireland, you'll see why, shockingly, Northern Ireland is in fact, uh, on many views, uh, the most restrictive country in the European Union and the Council of Europe when it comes to abortion. Uh, now, Ireland is pretty close. I think you could use different yardsticks. Um, but there is fundamental concerns about UK women and a part of the UK that we need to look at, I think, today. And that's an important part of the context for the 50th anniversary. Just very quickly, given the time, and because Linda's covered it so uh, fabulously, um, the US and its global reach, I think there are challenging times for women's rights, particularly with the Trump presidency, but also in the lead up to it. Uh, there have been recent state-level restrictions on abortion in the US, uh, 288 restrictions introduced in the past five years. Uh, the result is, I've given you the quote from the Texas Policy Evaluation Project, there's an estimate that somewhere between 100,000 and 240,000 women aged 18 to 49 in the US have tried to end a pregnancy on their own without medical assistance in the past five years. And they are horrifying figures uh, that I think should be in lights and we should be aware of. I just picked out three key things about Trump and abortion rights, um, which would be very familiar to you, I think. The global gag rule, which Linda referred to, is horrifying the Mexico City policy. Uh, there's also his attack on Planned Parenthood, his intended attack on Roe and Wade. And also importantly, uh, in terms of global reproductive rights, he has threatened to pull US funding to the US Population Fund, which provides contraceptives to some of the most vulnerable women worldwide. And that's why I referred to the global reach. I mean, this isn't just a policy which is affecting US women. It's something which could fundamentally change reproductive rights uh, on a global scale. And it's something we do need to be shouting about. We need to be putting our hats on and taking to the streets about it. Uh, and Linda is absolutely right to draw that to our attention. Uh, and I quite like this cartoon, uh, Make American Women Die in Back Alley Abortions Again, which is uh, perhaps a little extreme, but uh, it, there are very, very real concerns uh, that we need to be aware of in relation to what's happening with abortion rights on the other side of the water that Linda drew our attention to. Okay, international standards. This is the law slide. This can easily be done very quickly. Um, so international human rights bodies have repeatedly made clear that criminalization of health services which only women require, including abortion, is a form of discrimination against women. Uh, they've repeatedly recommended that states remove all punitive provisions for women who've undergone abortion and ensure access to lawful abortion. Uh, and there's also specific provisions for girls, for under 18 year olds. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has highlighted the importance of adolescent girls' reproductive rights, recommended that states ensure access to safe abortion 
and also post-abortion post care services, irrespective of whether abortion itself is legal in the state. And that's quite critical when we think of Northern Ireland and Ireland. Uh, speaking of which, Northern Ireland. So the legal framework, just very briefly, under the 1861 Act, there is horrifyingly a penalty of up to life imprisonment for both the woman undergoing the abortion and for an individual who assists her. Now, I was very proud when I saw women here in solidarity with Polish women taking to the streets, taking to Twitter, campaigning about how outrageous it was when there was a proposal to restrict abortion law in Poland earlier this year. Similarly, there's been great support for women in the Republic here. Uh, but I have found myself thinking, look in your own backyard. There are horrifying restrictions in Northern Ireland. And I think a lot of people in England, Wales and Scotland simply are not aware of the position in Northern Ireland. And many of the women who were horrified at what was happening in Poland were saying things like this would never happen in the UK. And it is happening in the UK. The proposals in Poland are very similar to what we have already. The proposals which were seen off in Poland are very similar to what we have in Northern Ireland. And that's why the abortion regime in Northern Ireland is one of the most restrictive in the EU and the Council of Europe. The maximum criminal penalty imposed is the harshest in Europe, amongst the harshest in the world, only beaten by a small number of countries who retain the death penalty uh, for abortion. A rather odd position to adopt, perhaps, on a pro-life stance about abortion. Um, uh, but th th there we go. Uh, and the result of that is there's a very steady stream of pregnant women who travel from Northern Ireland to England uh, every year. Uh, the estimates vary. Um, the official statistics for the last year we have available are a bit over 800. Um, but it's recognised by the FPA in particular that really the estimates are quite low because a lot of women give false addresses uh, because of the shame and stigma. Now, there's two cases. Uh, how am I doing? Oh. You've got eight minutes. Ah, OK. There's two cases that I wanted to focus on, and we're very lucky to have Jude Bunting, one of our token men in the audience, <laughs> uh, who actually is working on the first one. Um, so corner him afterwards if you've got more detailed questions. The first case I wanted to mention is uh, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission's application. Uh, and that's a case you may have heard of. It's a case in Northern Ireland where Mr Justice Horner has ruled that the near outright ban on abortion in Northern Ireland breaches the human rights of women and girls. Uh, so just in brief summary, it was decided uh, for the lawyers in the room, there was no breach of Article 3 or of Article 14, but there was a breach of Article 8 because of the absence of exceptions in two particular cases. And they were uh, the fact that there wasn't an exception for fatal fetal abnormalities and not an exception for pregnancies which are a consequence of sexual crime uh, up to the date when a fetus becomes capable of existing independently of the mother. So this is a very important win in Northern Ireland law, but it's very much on the fringes of those 1,000 women, potentially 2,000 women, who travel every year. So it's a tiny proportion of cases, and it's only those categories, but still extremely important. And Mr Justice Horner gave a declaration of incompatibility, so finding that Northern Irish law is not compatible with Article 8, the right to private and family life. Now the catch is, there was an appeal, government appealed, was heard last summer, and the judgment is still awaited. So watch this space. Um, you might think perhaps it would be a judgment which would be rushed, given its urgency. We're still waiting. Uh, and maybe don't ask Jude about that. He may not be able to say very much about what's going on behind the scenes. Um, the second case is the one which I'm very privileged uh, to work on with Angela. Many of you in the room are also uh, acting in it for um, NGOs who've intervened. We're very grateful for that. So the British Humanist Association, for example, has intervened, represented by Kate Beatty and Heather Williams, and a large number of reproductive rights organisations have intervened, represented by uh, Jude. Uh, and this is a case which was heard in the Supreme Court shortly before uh, Christmas. It's another reason why we can blame Brexit. We thought we might get a judgment before Christmas, but Brexit got in the way. They got a judgment very promptly, and we're still waiting, and we don't have an indication about how long it's going to be. Um, so the issue here was a challenge to the bar in Northern Ireland on women accessing abortion services when they travel to the rest of the UK on the NHS. So when a woman from Northern Ireland travels uh, to England, almost inevitably, uh, she is barred from accessing NHS services. She cannot even access NHS services that can then be charged back. So the only option for a woman from Northern Ireland when she travels to England is to go to a private abortion clinic. It's actually a worse position than women from Poland or women from the Republic who are in fact entitled to access NHS services but then be charged back. Uh, although most of them do also go to private clinics. And there's a particular problem at the moment with the lack of capacity 
in private clinics uh, in England. Uh, so in fact, many women are being turned away and cannot come to clinics in England. Um, but our client was a young teenager from a low income family, uh, discovered she was pregnant, wanted an abortion. Uh, her and her mother wanted her to have a, a termination. And they go to the GP. They're told the only way that they can do it is by raising the funds to travel to, thank you, raising the funds to travel to England to have the abortion over here. And because they're a low income family, and also because of her age, her mother simply had to travel with her, which of course increased the, increases the cost. It takes many weeks before they can raise the funds, and they only raise the funds through assistance from a charity. And the result of that, of course, is that when she ultimately has the abortion, it's much more advanced than it would have been if she could have had it at six weeks when her pregnancy was diagnosed. It's more physically invasive, much more emotionally distressing. And that delay is a direct consequence of the fact that there's a bar on accessing uh, NHS abortion services. Uh, and the European Court of Human Rights has referred to health risks to women resulting from such delays in a different context. Many years ago, Open Door Counselling in Dublin, Well Woman in Ireland, that was a case about lack of information about abortion services in England and Wales for women in Ireland. And I should say, so I'm 40, uh, I was a teenager at this time, and if you bought Cosmopolitan magazine or Just 17, what you had literally in the 90s was a censor had cut out at the back of the magazine abortion ads. So you'd get your magazine and then at the back there'd be all these little gaps. I mean, it's incredible that this happened 20 years ago because I'm quite young, as Dillis has pointed out. <laughs> 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 so, uh, Mara Clark from the Abortion Support Network has made a really important point about Northern Ireland, uh, which I, I must say, which is and that actually the combination of the criminalisation of abortion in Northern Ireland and then the barriers on travelling to another part of the UK really is a class issue. It's a restriction which hurts poor people. Um, their service gets calls from refugees, homeless people, people in abusive relationships, young women, old women who may not have visas, passports, money, or the support network to travel to England. And when you can't afford to travel to England uh, for illegal abortion, uh, their service has evidence of women taking uh, extreme measures like these described here. Uh, so one woman's account was, I drank bleach, I took three packs of birth control pills with a bottle of vodka, I threw myself down a flight of stairs, I've been trying to figure out how to crash my car, but not permanently injure myself or die. And that, folks, is the UK in 2017. So I'm not going to do this because of the time, but very briefly, our challenge in A and B was a challenge that it's discriminatory and it's also a breach of the common law, that there's been a failure by the Secretary of State for Health in England to discharge his duty to meet all reasonable requirements uh, for health services. And a really critical thing to understand about how the case has been argued is the Secretary of State for Health in England essentially says... Um, that there are two types of service. There's an emergency service. So if you're a woman from Northern Ireland and you're over here in London, you get hit by a bus on the street. That's an emergency. You can get NHS services. You're not turned away from A&E. Uh, and everything else is considered elective and you can't have it. So abortion for a woman who lives in a part of the UK where if she has an abortion or anyone assists her, that is punishable by up to life imprisonment. That is considered in the same category as having a boob job. I mean, that's the position that we're in. Uh, and that kind of very binary approach is uh, something which, as you can tell, I'm ranting about. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I won't do this just given the time, but can I just flag it for you that um, abortion is, wasn't in fact decriminalised by the 1967 Act. Instead, what you've got in the 1967 Act is a defence. So the 1861 Act does still criminalise abortion in, in, in England and Wales. And there's a series of reasons why there's concerns about the current position about it being patronising to women, uh, and uh, I've given a quick list of reasons, just five in particular, um, which might support in the 50th year us in England and Wales thinking about whether the 1967 Act now reflects the position. So five points, patronising to women, it's at odds with the principle of bodily autonomy, it does seem bizarre that a woman can't be forced to donate a kidney to a dying child, can be compelled to sustain a foetus inside her body against her will, unless she has, uh, she falls within this exception. The punishment is entirely disproportionate. If you've got a young woman who takes abortion pills bought online, uh, so not going through the two doctor approval system, she could be in prison for a lengthy period. A doctor who provides safe abortion care to a woman who requests it without approval of a colleague, they could be sent to prison. Uh, and is that really uh, the right position for us now? Uh, and then a couple of other points there. And finally, I'm not gonna say anything about this, but I do want to play something for you. Um, 
the position in Ireland, uh, which I'm very concerned about, and you can speak to Cara about it more, uh, there's a little video which we want to show you. And I'll finish with that. Centuries ago, women accused of witchcraft faced, amongst other ordeals, trial by war. Tied to a chair or run under a boat. If she survives the drowning and floats, she's a witch. If she dies, she's a woman. We are not witches, but if the church and state insist, then let us be the descendants of all the witches they could not drown. This heirloom of trauma, this curse, this agony of water, in order to hold agency over our bodies. Not all of us have survived. The waves do not part. There are no miracles here. When a stethoscope is a crucifix on your belly. How do you have any choice but the water? Unfair medical treatment on other shores. A body is 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 a body not a house not a city not a vessel not a country the laws of the church have no place on your flesh the veterinarian will abort a calf if a cow falls ill how is it that livestock is worth more to this land than us Seven women every day leave Ireland seeking an abortion abroad. We ask for the land over the water, home of the trial, choice over none, for our foremothers, for ourselves, for the generations yet to come. Witches or women, these are our bodies, we shall not be given up. to making um, that really powerful film. We'll now move on to, um, last but not least, Mary Varney, who's a partner at Lee Day. Her human rights and judicial review practice has secured access to vital NHS medical treatment for many vulnerable patients. She's challenged um, really, um, uh, really important decisions such as the way in which medical professionals made decisions around do not resuscitate, absolutely crucial decision. And she's had some landmark um, decisions and cases in relation to women's access to fertility treatment and tackle, tackle decisions based on discriminatory approaches and um, actions of um, public authorities. And now I'll hand you over to Mary. Thank you, thank you Angela. I'm really privileged to be here today and talking on, on this panel. Um, I'm going to be talking about a few topics where I think the law could do more to protect the reproductive rights of women in this country, but outside the context of abortion. Uh, and it's going to be a quick whistle-stop run-through, although I quite like being called a bloody difficult woman, so <laughs> maybe I will aim for that, with a few calls uh, for action, at looking at fertility treatment uh, and focusing in particular on the availability of NHS-funded fertility treatment, birth rights and the respect for personal autonomy in maternity care, and ending in uh, uh, talking about surrogacy, an issue where the law in this country is in a really poor state, but there is a considerable difference in views between some of the organisations campaigning in the area as to how best it should be developed. So starting with NHS-funded fertility treatment, about 50,000 women each year in the UK receive fertility treatment, and it's around 42% of those, so just under half, who receive NHS funding. And unfortunately, the provision of NHS funding varies wildly, well, sorry, wildly, wildly, but widely across the country. 
The postcode lottery that you've probably heard about, it is alive and kicking. So where a woman lives can dictate whether she'll get any NHS funded treatment at all, how many cycles she might get, what sorts of treatment, I mean, there are so many variables. And I find this a very depressing state of affairs, not least because in 2014, the High Court ruled that it was a fundamental human right of every patient to be treated in exactly the same way as anyone else with the same clinical need. That was said by Mr. Justice Jay in a case I was instructed in of Elizabeth Rose and Thanet Clinical Commissioning, Commissioning Group. Lizzie Rose, as I call her and got to know her, was at the time an amazing 25-year-old who'd suffered severe Crohn's disease throughout her life. Since 14 years old, she had really significantly had her quality of life uh, diminished from the disease. Uh, and well, despite that, she continued her studies uh, and managed to work to the extent that her condition would allow. At the time I met her, she was really unwell, too unwell to work. She was receiving disability living allowance and had been recommended that she undergo bone marrow transplant treatment and chemotherapy with the hope of bringing her disease into remission and improving her quality of life. She'd made multiple applications for funding to have the treatment, to have her eggs removed because the probable outcome of the treatment would be that she was rendered infertile and suffer an early onset of the menopause. An awful lot for any, to any woman to deal with, especially a 25-year-old. She wanted to secure the best chance of having her own genetic children one day and supported by the clinicians who were treating her Crohn's disease, she applied, as I said, for funding for what's known as cryopreservation, layman's terms, egg freezing, um, before her treatment began and her CCG had refused to provide that funding. Lizzie felt this was particularly unfair because at the time there were national guidelines by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which recommended that the treatment should be available on the NHS and that the CCG should, uh, should be funding this. She also felt particularly aggrieved that the CCG had decided to have a policy that they would uh, uh, offer and fund cryopreservation of both sperm and embryos. She was given no explanation for this difference in treatment. We brought a very urgent case uh, because Lizzie's health was deteriorating and although, and I hate saying this on a microphone, in narrow legal terms we lost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> technicality, technicality, yes, very much so. Uh, Lizzie was able to receive the treatment she required and it was supported by the CC, she was supported by the CCG in that respect. And the judgment uh, not only the sentence that I read out earlier, but it, it set down a firm marker of what is expected from the NHS in determining policies in relation to fertility treatment. Despite the court having found, as I said, that it is just a basic human right to get equal treatment where you have the same clinical need, the postcode lottery remains. The judgment went further and Mr Justice Jay had to grapple with the fact that this case involved not just whether or not there was difference in treatment between men and women, but whether that treatment arose because of what he described as the obvious, thank you for that, relevant biological differences between the gametes that a man produces and a woman produces. And importantly, although recognising that this was a case and difference in treatment could simply arise from that biological difference, that didn't mean that the CCG could ignore their duty to have due regard to the need to reduce inequalities in their services. And in the judgment, the clinical commissioning group were heavily criticised for essentially saying, well, we know there's a gender issue here, and then full stop. They did nothing about it. And the court said this comes very close to paying lip service to the fundamental duty to uphold public sector equality, the, sorry, the fundamental obligation to uphold the public sector equality duty. So despite that, in 2014, this is an area I feel very strongly that the law could and should do more to protect the re reproductive rights of women. 
we should be acting to stamp out the postcode lottery and doing what we can to make sure that women who have to rely on fertility treatment to realise their right to start a family get the same treatment wherever they live. Turning next to the topic of birth rights, this is an area where I, as a human rights lawyer, am seeing a considerable rise in inquiries from women who want to ensure that they have the freedom to make their own choices regarding maternity care and childbirth. I get asked frequently, are birth plans binding? Can I demand a C-section? I've been referred to social services because I don't want medical intervention. Is that okay? Or I felt pressure to undergo an induction when I didn't want to. For me, these are basic rights about personal dignity and autonomy. We've heard about them in the context of auto abortion and a woman's autonomy over the, her body. I believe they apply equally here. Unfortunately, we repeatedly hear stories of women who received unexplained medical interventions during childbirth, or they have their choices ignored, or they're simply bullied into agreement. I think we're fairly lucky in the UK that we can actually choose where we wish to give birth. That's not a right that many women and women across Europe don't have. Disappointingly, in November last year, the European Court of Human Rights had a chance to rule on this issue in a case concerning the Czech Republic, where national law prohibits midwives from assisting women with home births. There were two women claimants in that case. Both had previously had births at home, and they wished to give birth to their next child at home. In a split decision of seven to five, the European Court found that although Article 8 rights were engaged and the law was an interference, they really disappointingly decided that it wasn't an unlawful interference to stop women being able to have the assistance of midwives at home births. I highlight this, as I say, as another area where I think the law could and should do more to protect women. And an example in where we have this threat to the Human Rights Act at the moment, why we need Article 8 protections and the loss of the Human Rights Act could lead to a real void in the law protecting women's rights in maternity care and childbirth. I doubt anyone and hope that no one in this room needs convincing to stand up against the repealing of the Human Rights Act. But in the spirit of having cause to action, there's another one. <laughs> so finally, I'm going to turn to surrogacy if I'm all right for time. Um, and really, I'm raising this because I know I'm the last to speak on the panel, and it's an area that I'm really interested to hear the views of uh, audience and other panellists. Um, for those who don't know, the UK surrogacy laws were written in the 1980s, uh, and pretty much most people who are involved in uh, modern UK surrogacy feel that the law is woefully out of date and completely impractical. To give you just a, a, an overview of some of the issues uh, in terms of how the law currently works, the surrogate and her spouse become the legal parents of, a, a, of the baby when it's born. A child can remain in legal, legal limbo for up to a year until uh, the intended parents, uh, as they're known, go to the family courts and get a parental order to grant them parental responsibility and parental rights over their own, uh, over their own child. It's also completely illegal in the UK to advertise for a surrogate, meaning that the uh, current organisations who, who help people uh, find surrogates in, in this country have had to close their doors at the moment to intended parents because they simply can't find enough women who, who are willing uh, and able to be surrogates. surrogates. Uh, and for surrogacy agencies, it's illegal for them to make a profit. It's not illegal per se for a woman to make a profit out of what I call renting her womb. But the law does appear to restrict payments to reasonable expenses. And frankly, the rules are confusing and unenforceable. And I'd like to end my presentation today on asking for wider views on whether a woman should be supported by the law to rent her womb if she so chooses. I've canvassed the views of several friends and colleagues, male and female, uh, before today, and I found an almost even split in the responses. For what it's worth, it's my view that subject to proper safeguards, women should be entitled to exercise the personal autonomy over their bodies in whichever way they choose. And those who abuse women who make the choices they do, as in any other area, should be held accountable rather than restricting the rights of women. Thank you. Thank you.
very much, Mary. So we've had, as you can see, a whole range of issues um, discussed by panellists. And um, summarising those is looking at issues around revising the Abortion Act, whether um, steps should be taken to broaden its remit, um, because it doesn't completely decriminalise abortion. Looking at the acute position in Northern Ireland, and looking at our sisters there who are UK citizens, but who are treated so very differently to us in England and Wales. Um, and looking at the Republic, we've got um, individuals here, so please liaise with those um, sisters afterwards. And looking at some of the issues raised by Mary in terms of um, access to NHS treatment, um, given women autonomy over the kind of childbirth process, looking at postcode lottery. We would like, ideally, to have some feedback from you today through questions, and we have a, a reporter here um, who will be drawing up a, a report afterwards. But if you could bear in mind, those are the uh, key themes and issues, and if you make your observations and comments now um, and try to put forward suggestions in terms of a way forward, because it will be good uh, not only to share the concerns and debate them, but to have a way forward and to be proactive um, as, as active women today. So um, we're going to pass the mic around the room and I'll suggest that we take about four questions and if you could just very briefly say who you are and then those questions will be shared amongst the panellists and we'll see how we go for time. We've got a good almost 15 minutes so I think that's not too bad. So um, anybody with any burning questions or observations or suggestions in terms of action points? I'd imagine that we might want to put together a subcommittee uh, from today. Keenan, would you say we put together a subcommittee to take forward um, action? <coughs> so I think there was a hand at the back and Cara. So we start with Cara and then um, somebody at the back. Yes. So Cara. Hi, my name's Cara. I'm from the London Irish Abortion Rights Campaign. We've been set up to um, bring the Irish community and people who are interested in abortion rights in Ireland and in Northern Ireland together to do what we can from London. Um, we started in October, we've got about 900 people in our group now. We work across five different working groups or teams doing lots of different things. Um, we need people with all different kinds of skills and all different amounts of time. Um, so if you have any interest in getting involved, then please go to our website, uh, londonirishark.com, or come and talk to me after. Um, we do all kinds of things. We need people to draft documents, to engage with diplomats, um, to help us run events. Um, so whatever you can offer, that would be great. Um, one thing that as a group we really need to think about in terms of campaigning is developing a really strong and co coherent call to action for the north of Ireland. We know that something needs to change and the lawyers are doing a great job of taking th things through the courts. Um, but as campaigners we need to talk to each other and develop something as clear as the call to action is repeal. Um, so we're working on that for Northern Ireland as well with the different groups that are active there. Um, so please support us in that. So there was a question at the back. Uh, yes, yeah, Susie Allegri, I'm an associate at, at Doughty Street Chambers as well. Um, it's not really a question, it's more an observation and a shout out uh, for a niche area that I'm originally from the Isle of Man. So all the talk about Northern Ireland uh, and the Republic, the same happens to the sisters halfway across the Irish Sea uh, in the Isle of Man, and they've currently got a campaign for abortion law modernisation, so don't forget the people on even smaller islands uh, and their campaign. Absolutely fair point. Yes. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Jane Ellis, I'm with the International Bar Association. Um, I've really enjoyed this afternoon's session. I've found it very, very interesting. One thing I have really observed, though, is that a lot of the dialogue that we are having today is not dissimilar to the dialogue that I remember experiencing as a student in the 1980s. Uh, it seems to me that the most profound shift that, hurt, that occurred was when uh, Dillis Cossey was actually uh, facilitated the reform or, or the, the introduction of the Abortion Act. Can you say that we really made a lot of progress over the last 50 years? And, and how close or how soon are we likely to achieve that? Anybody want to answer that? Dennis? Well, we haven't come as far as I would have wanted. But we have come some way. But the quote I gave 
was we've won many battles, but the war goes on. Um, and um, I think that the last half century in, in England or in Britain has been taken up with defending the Abortion Act. Oh, is, that, is it on now? Okay. I'm just saying that I'd, it's not come, we've not come as far as I would have liked, but we've made some progress. We've uh, won some battles, but the war goes on, goes on and the war will continue to go on. Um, and the past half century has been spent in defending the Unsatisfactory Abortion Act. Um, that all that the, we have actually defended it successfully and indeed made a slight bit of progress which arose out of the debates on the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, the first one, in 1990. Um, so you have to count these little, little steps forward. But in terms of um, sexuality and sexual behavior, when you think of... Um, you know, the, the, the way we now talk about reproductive and sexual health and rights. It's a great, that's a big step forward from what we used to call birth control or contraception and abortion. So in terminology and in attitude, I think we have gone some way. But in, certainly in abortion, I think we could have gone much further. Oh, I do think that one of the things that has, um, which really pushed things um, on was the advent of medical abortion which um, meant that women could take uh, medication orally rather than having to undergo a procedure. Um, and that has moved the debate on. Now, that's why I think we should be talking about decriminalization, um, because that is the next step forward, in my view. And I think very much that we have to take the movement forward ourselves. No one's going to take it forward for us. And so I, you know, I think one of the really important things of forums such as today is um, listening to one another, having the expertise of specialists and experts who have gone before us and who will go ahead of us and to really plan action and move forward. Um, can we have another question here at the front? Oh, no, I just, I wanted to see where Cara and Susan, but I can do that afterwards when I listen. Um, hi, I'm Aisha. I'm from LSE. I'm doing Human Rights Masters. Um, my question is more about how this relates to women's rights, reproductive rights in prisons as well, and um, whether it covers them in, in prisons, reproductive rights. So I know you were talking about the story of a woman who had to give birth in, in detention, and so um, what rights are afforded to women if we do progress with the Act who are in prison? Um. Mary? Well, one of the other panelists may be better uh, uh, to, to answer this, but um, as far as uh, my awareness goes, the treatment of women in prisons in terms of their reproductive rights is pretty poor. Um, in, in fact, it's worse, as you've heard me highlight some areas for women not in prison. Um, uh, and I think... Uh, in terms of, of women who have been criminalised for something that uh, is long overdue, that it should be decriminalised, um, I want to see an immediate release programme for them. Do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, just, um, I just want to answer three of the questions. So something Cara said, something Susie said, and then what um, you said, Aisha. Um, it's I Aisha, right? Okay. Um, so first of all, on what Cara said about Northern Ireland and the message, I mean, the repeal T-shirt, you saw the video, it's really powerful, it's very simple. So in Ireland, there is a constitutional ban on abortion. It's in the Eighth Amendment. It was passed in the early 1980s. Repeal the Eighth is the hashtag. It's very simple. The problem in Northern Ireland is um, that a number of uh, groups say, well, we should extend the 1967 Act. Why should Northern Ireland be treated differently? So extend the 1967 Act. Some other groups say, we don't want to extend the 1967 Act. The 1967 Act is terrible. In fact, there should be decriminalisation in Northern Ireland and in circumstances where Northern Ireland is in the position that it's in, that's obviously quite an optimistic ask for now. And the result is that rather than having a T-shirt saying repeal, you would need to have a T-shirt saying 
extend the 1967 Act as your ultimate fallback, but ideally, in fact, what you would do is decriminalise. You know, it doesn't really... It's not the most catchy phrase. Uh, and and that, that may be one of the reasons... I think we've got the slide here, but that may be one of the reasons why, in fact, the Irish campaign has been so successful that you can see the result of the question is that people are very aware. So 60% of people who responded said Ireland has the most restrictive uh, laws in Northern Ireland. So the message is getting through, but it's quite hard for the message about Northern Ireland to get through, in part because of that issue about what the packaging is. And secondly, um, Susie, on the Isle of Man. I, I do think the Crown dependencies, the Isle of Man, uh, Guernsey and Jersey, shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, but I don't think they're in the same position as Northern Ireland. Uh, the position is that in each of those Crown dependencies, first of all, they're not part of the UK, uh, nor are they part of the British Overseas Territories. They're obviously independent administered jurisdictions which are self-governing possessions of the Crown. And they're not part of the EU, although they're within the EU's customs area. Uh, they are territories for which the UK is responsible, but I don't think they're in quite the same position as... I'm not suggesting we don't look at it, but I think it's a slightly different situation to Northern Ireland. But also, really importantly, in each of those, abortion is legal in all three. Uh, the issue is that there are restrictions on the circumstances in which abortion can be performed, but it's not at all as bad as in the position in Northern Ireland. Uh, and there are practical problems. So, for example, in the Isle of Man, um, they've got legislation loosely modelled on the 1967 Act, the Termination of Pregnancy Act 1995, which essentially means, in, in principle, abortion is legal in certain circumstances, but in practice, abortions are very, very difficult to access. Uh, and that's because uh, they've modelled the requirement about the number of sign-off doctors there's a tiny pool of people able to do it. And the result of it is that um, uh, there's a stream of women who can't in practice access abortions, even though they're technically entitled to it uh, within the Isle of Man. And they travel uh, to England and Wales and they have the same problems about cost in England and Wales. And there were 150 of them last year. And I do think there's an issue uh, about them, but I don't think they're in quite the same position as Northern Ireland. Same is true of Jersey and Guernsey. They've got legislation broadly modelled on the 1967 Act, which was just cut and pasted to a situation where it doesn't really make much sense uh, because of the size of the population, a range of other things. And finally, on your question, um, I think the issue on reproductive rights in prisons, um, there's obviously the issues Linda raised about the problems with gynaecological care in the uh, US. There's similar problems here uh, with access to healthcare generally in prisons, and that includes access to prompt cancer assessment, cancer treatment, access to proper reproductive uh, care. Uh, but there is also a particular issue about um, mother and baby units and pregnant women coming into prison and their needs not being assessed and the needs of their unborn children not being assessed sufficiently quickly. Uh, and I can talk to you about it in more detail afterwards. There's quite a good case from a couple of years ago called WB, uh, where it was found that there was a systemic problem um, in one privately run prison, which I think is indicative of the problems across the prison estate, where a woman with very little English had come in in August, heavily pregnant, uh, well, pregnant, due in December, and there was no assessment of whether she was entitled to a mother and baby unit place uh, until a week before her due date. And she then got a negative decision, which it turns out was completely unlawful. But by the time she could appeal it and challenge it, her baby had already been removed. And it was a fight to get her baby back. Uh, and that is horrifying and concerning and something which I also think we should be looking at and doing something about. Um, OK, i um, not going to be able to take all of the questions um, for people to have their hands up. I'll take a very quick one from Helena. Anybody else who's got questions could ask afterwards. I'm sorry, there was one person at the back on the right who um, had their hand raised before. So, Helena, if, if I could yes. respectfully ask you to no, be very absolutely, brief. Absolutely, but, it, but it's really important, or I, wouldn't, I would keep my, myself quiet. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but, but, but it, it, it really is the reality of, of, of law and, and we as feminist reformers having to deal with politics. And, and it's a conversation that I've had, I think, probably with Dillis, but with many colleagues in, um, who've been concerned about abortion laws for a long time, which is the campaign to decriminalise becomes a problem when you're dealing with late abortion. Um, and that's where you run into the face of those who do the horror stories of, this is going to allow uh, the abortion of viable 
you know, babies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you have to be very careful about how this is campaigned for. And so I just want to remind everybody that, you know, as you know, we've seen, that's the way in which um, uh, the whole business of women's reproductive freedom is undermined. So there has to be a better strategy than just this bland call yeah. for uh, yeah. uh, decriminalizing. I, I quite agree. I, th I think that um, I've already sort of come up against this on the 24 week and the, the place of the Infant Life Preservation Act and, and, the, uh, and, and then the sections in the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act. All those are, are sort of, the pe people need to be very, very clear about what they want before they embark on, um, on a campaign because it could go badly wrong. Yeah. I agree. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but panellists will be around for individuals who want to approach them for questions. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dillis, Keelan and Mary for giving us such a comprehensive, wide-ranging, completely stimulating um, last hour debating these issues around our rights as women, um, around our bodies, autonomy, autonomy and reproductive rights. If we could put our hands together. Thank you.